can't be that simple. Wow. What? We got something. Hey, y'all. Welcome back to the Hack Shack. Today, we've got another box from the folks at Hacker Boxes. This is Hacker Box 114, and the name is Whopper. Let's get this on the bench and see what we have inside here. This looks like a Max 7219 8x32 dot matrix display module. We've got three of these in total. This is a USB-C to USB-A cable. Here we have some header pins with a 2.54 millimeter pitch. Here we've got our two Whopper connector PCBs as well as the Whopper control interface PCB. This is an ESP32C3 Super Mini development board. This is an ESP32S3 board with a 1.9 inch 170 by 320 smart display. Kind of like a baby brother to the cheap yellow display we've used before. You might recognize this from the intro. This is a really cool Whopper sticker. I like that a lot. And last but not least, we've got our HackerBox 114 collectible reference card with some nice pinouts on the front and back for the devices we'll be using in this kit. Just like they always do, the folks from HackerBoxes have included a great set of instructions here available on Instructables. I have a link to that in the description. Even if you don't have the HackerBox, you might find it pretty handy. All right, one of the first things the Instructable has us do is just power up our ESP32 board and verify our tool chain. Uh, the power is applied. We should see the red power LED illuminate. It says nothing else will happen, but you can see we've got a pretty fast blink going there. Next, you want to hop over into your Arduino environment and you want to go to Board Manager and search for ESP32, Expressive Systems version there. You can see I've already got that installed. If you didn't, you'd have the install button and you can see here I had an update waiting. So I went ahead and hit that update and got that installed. And next you wanna to go to tools, board, ESP32, and then select the no logo ESP32 C3 Super Mini. Then you wanna make sure that you've got the associated COM port to be the one that popped up when you plug this board in. Next you wanna open up file examples, basic, blink, and then push that to the board. And as you can see here, we've got that blink going and it's a little slower than what it was doing when we first powered it up. So this is a good test and verification that we can push code to this board and we should be ready to move on. All right, the first thing we're gonna be soldering is putting this C3 Super Mini board onto this little small PCB right here. And we're gonna be soldering these castellated style connections, which is a little bit different than through hole stuff, but it's not all that bad. There's a tutorial mentioned in the Instructable that's pretty good. You can check that out if you want to get some ideas on how to do that if you just don't want to play it by ear. Okay, next we're going to grab our first 8x32 dot matrix display module and pay attention here. This will be important throughout the build this in and out direction. So make sure you make note of that. So we're gonna grab the first end here where it says in, and we're gonna pull that module off. And also a quick note, say you got the letters on these sides. It, when you remove these modules and put them back on, you wanna make sure that all the letters are on the same side for the correct orientation. So we're gonna pull this first one off. Then you want to snap off five mil header pins. And you want to insert your header pins in such a way that the long side is what's sticking on the opposite side of where the panels are. Just like you'll see me do here. And I'm going to use a little blue tack to hold these in place. So when I flip it over, they won't move around much when I try to solder them initially.
Next, you want to use whatever method works best for you to get the little black piece of plastic off your header pins, but don't be so rough that you tear anything up. And then that board's just going to set down on there just like that, and we're going to solder it in place. Then we can use your clippers if you want and get the excess leads off of there. And again, pay attention to the writing. When we put this module back in here, we want to make sure that the writing is facing the same direction as all the other modules to make sure it's got the right orientation. At this stage, we can plug some USB power back in and see if things are still blinking. That's a good indicator that we didn't short anything out in this process and we can move on to the next steps. All right, now the instructor has us get back into Arduino and we're going to look in the library manager for this library called MD Parola by Magic Designs. So we're going to search for that and then hit the install button to get that put in. And make sure you click this thing to say install all so you get the dependencies that it needs there. Once that's installed, we want to open the sketch file example mdmax72xx, mdmax72xx test. And we're instructed to take these five lines here from the instructable and replace the first lines that are in the sketch. Then we push that to the board. And when that's done, you should be able to see some pretty cool patterns on your matrix that kind of prove it's working okay. Okay, next what we're going to do here is take our module, but this time we're going to take the LED matrix pack off of the opposite end here on the output side. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to snap off five pins and solder it in the same exact way we did on the other one. Sorry for the bad focus here. We're going to stick our module back in again. Make sure that the writing on your module is matching the same direction as the other ones. And wait before, use whatever means you want to get your piece of plastic off the pins. You should have a pretty good understanding of what we're doing now. So now on this module, which is going to be the middle one, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to put some pins on the input side there. And then we're going to do the same exact thing and put some pins on the output side there. Don't forget, writing goes back to writing. And at this point, we're ready to join our first two boards together. You see, you'll put them like this. The out on the first one goes to the in on the second one. And we use these connector boards and it doesn't matter which side you use. I've got the whopper side facing out and then you just solder those together and then those are joined. Now on our last module, same thing, rinse, repeat. We're going to do our input pins. We don't necessarily need to do any output pins because this is the last module. So we're just going to solder some pins on the input side. And then the same thing, make sure you line up that right and get that module in there the right way. And we line these up just like we did between boards one and two. We use the same little join board there and solder those. And then we'll have all three linked together. Next, the instructor tells us to open up file example mdmax72xx, mdmax72xx pacman. And get that open. It also tells us to take these five lines from the instructable. And we're going to replace these lines right here and nuke the original ones out. Then we push that to the board. And when that goes, we should see a little Pac-Man animation if everything went okay. And it looks like it did. That's pretty fun. Next, the instructable invites us to download this Whopper Blinking Licton sketch to give us some Whopper light lights. So we push that to the board and you flip it over here and look, it looks just like the animations on the Whopper computer from War Games. Very, very cool. And if you check out the instructable, you'll see that this project was originally for someone wanting to have like Whopper lights in a 19 inch rack. And uh, if you follow through there, you'll see a couple of different projects kind of associated. And there are some STL files, so I grabbed that and 
printed some out to kind of see how that would work. And here you can see what our finished print pieces look like. So it ends up being four different pieces. And I think uh, ideally what you would do is glue these together and they would kind of end up, you know, looking like a little normal rack mount frame for the LED module. But if you look here, you'll see that when everything is in there, the one I printed, and I didn't really pay much attention, I just printed out the first thing I grabbed, it's a little bit too wide for our module size. So um, there may be one that's exactly right, or this could probably easily be modified to fit pretty exact. But still, it's so very cool to have an option like this. And I can think that this would be really neat in a rack, and then probably others have too. Besides the fun lights, you could also have some things like stats for your, you know, like your NAS or network traffic or system load. That'd be a really cool use for something like this. I dig it. This is a really cool project. All right, the next thing we're checking out is this ESP32S3 development board that's got the built-in 1.9 inch display. And our first basic test is just applying power and from the factory, it's gonna have this little diagnostic built-in, which should let you know that your screen and board are working okay. All right, the next thing our instructable advises us to do is roll back our ESP32 board libraries back to 2.0.11. So uh, go ahead and did that here. And then the instructable goes on to tell us to use the library manager to install a TFT ESPI by Bodmer. You can see when I search for it, I already have it installed, so I don't need to install that. And then we're instructed to grab these settings here and to put those in our user underscore setup dot H file under the libraries folder for TFT ESPI within our Arduino hierarchy. One quick note while I'm editing, I think I did not capture the footage where I'm supposed to show you to go in a select board ESP32 ESP32 S3 dev module, but just go to that and then also make sure you select the right COM port that popped up when you plugged this particular board in and you'll be set. Next, the instructable tells us to open an example sketch like file example TFT ESPI generic and Julia underscore set. So we navigate to that and open it up. Then we push that to the board. And we're supposed to see some kind of, you know, graphic example demo kind of thing here. But as you can see here, I didn't get diddly squat. And I burned a bunch of time going back and forth thinking I had screwed up something in that settings file that I showed you earlier. Or some other weird thing or that I had a weird board that was off. And, you know, I knew since the board initially powered on with that sketch, it was probably just fine. And I actually jumped ahead and did a couple of things and they were fine. And... Ultimately, to just simplify it, I went back and removed the Bodmer libraries that I'd already had installed that had probably been goofed with for other various hacker boxes and other projects and just reinstalled that library. Then I pushed it again and got this. And that's working like it's supposed to. So makes me think about maybe having some kind of way to snapshot my Arduino environment or have separate ones for different hacker boxes so I don't get things goofed up and cause myself a bunch of headache in between different experiments. All right, next the hacker box has us check out this cool status display example. It says we need to go into library manager and we're going to need to add the NTP client by F Weinberg, the HTTP client by A McEwen, and the Arduino JSON by B Blanchin. Sorry if I got those names wrong, but we need to get all those libraries and then we're going to grab the sketch from the repo. And then once we have that, you'll see the spots inside there where you can put in the info, like your SSID and your key to get on wireless. And there's also a place down here where you can actually put in a nearby airport code. And it provides a place to look that up if you're not sure what one near you might be. And then you push that to it. And you get a really cool display that looks like this that has some neat little animations has the time and some of your local weather stats and it actually will also spit out some even greater detail on the serial output if you want to look at that 
Next, the Instructable invites us to check out the ESP32 Marauder software on this little board, which was made possible by the super awesome Frank Fletcher. You know, he ported this software to the original cheap yellow display and the Hackerbox folks sent him one of these little boards and looks like he ported it as well. So now you can use his very nice web flasher software. You go to that and um, you'll see the port selection there. Just you select the port that your little board's on and then you will select the board in his drop down. You'll pick the type C without touch 1.9 inch and then just hit program and it'll push that code to your board. With that flash, you can look and see how it boots up here. It brings it up and you get dropped into a menu. And I didn't realize at first uh, I needed to add a little something extra to be able to actually navigate it. All I could do was hit select or reboot at this point. I couldn't move the selection. I initially missed in the instructable where it tells us that we need to have a way to make that navigation possible. And we do that by basically grounding out GPIO 47 as a button press. And you can see where they show this small button in the picture here at the bottom of the board. So they have a little switch like that handy, but I had a jumper and a little bit of blue tack and figured I could at least verify that that weren't as expected. And then you can see what happened here. Using the wire like this allows us to navigate through the menus of Marauder. And as I blow through some of these things, you can see some of the features that are enabled. You can also look at the GitHub to see what all you can do with this. I'm not going to show any of the things really in action here. And I hope it goes without saying, don't mess with other people's stuff without permission. You know, with the exception of maybe possibly being slightly annoying. There's a ton of other cool stuff to check out in the Instructable. Again, that's free. Just follow the link in the description. Lots of other neat topics that you may not be familiar with that are very cool to dive into. I especially like the section here by Freaking and some of the links here for videos I love. I love the Connections Museum and I especially love this guy right here. His amazing collection is now going to be available at the Connections Museum in Denver, Colorado. How all this stuff used to work is so cool and interesting. Make sure to check out that one link from the Connections Museum YouTube channel to learn why in-band signaling is not always the best idea. Security by obscurity doesn't work when your audience is getting smarter every day. It looks like we're going to have ourselves another giveaway. The nice folks at Hackerboxes have graciously offered to send a Hackerbox 114 to a randomly picked commenter. We'll be picking the comment on August 2nd, 2025. And remember, Hackerboxes only ships to U.S. addresses for this giveaway. So if your comment's picked, but you don't have a U.S. shipping address that we can use, we'll need to pick someone else. Good luck. At the time of this recording, there are still Hackerbox 114s in stock. If you don't win the giveaway, you want to get one, check them out. Or go ahead and subscribe. Hey, if you made it this far, thanks for watching. Hope to see you again next time. Take care. Bye-bye.